Good morning and welcome to worship. It is Sunday, January the 10th, 2021. Today is the baptism of Jesus Sunday, but our worship today will also be a, a, a celebration of the Feast of Epiphany, which for us was this last Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, January the 6th in the church. And so we'll be doing today the Feast of Epiphany readings. But before we do that, it's been a rough week for us uh, in America. It uh, seems to me a good thing that we need to begin our worship today as we always do, uh, confessing our sins and receiving God's word of forgiveness. Isaiah chapter 60, our Old Testament reading for today says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. We're gathered in Epiphany, the season of light, to worship God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us humble ourselves before the Lord of all, confessing our sins of which we are aware, and for those things that grieve him of which we are unaware. Gracious God, who sent the light of the world into the darkness of our human sin. We come before you asking for your gracious mercy for all the things we have done and left undone. We have lived in darkness rather than seeking your light. We have ignored your call to serve our neighbors, and we have neglected to show our gratitude for all you've done for us. Forgive us, dear Lord. Let the light of Christ shine upon us and restore us to your salvation that we might live holy lives here and now and be with you in eternity. Amen. Lift up your eyes all around you and see. Your heart shall thrill and exult in the Lord's mercy. The Holy One of Israel, the Lord your God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forgives you all of your sins and grants you salvation in his holy name. Amen. May the glorious light of the Son of God shine upon you, the abiding love of the Father fill your hearts, and the peace of the promised Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, on this day, by the leading of a star, you revealed your only begotten Son to the nations. Mercifully grant that we, who know you by faith, may be brought to com contemplate the beauty of your majesty. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for the Day of Epiphany comes to us from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This is the visit of the wise men. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and behold, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are no by means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Here is my sermon starter from earlier in the week. As we celebrate today the Feast of Epiphany, it was on Wednesday of this week, I was thinking about the heavenly treat we got to enjoy back on the 21st of December. The alignment of the two largest planets in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. Now this happens about every 20 years, but not always during the month of December. And the last time these two planets were as close as they had been to one another was the year 1226 AD. And the next time they'll be this close is 60 years from now in the year 20 AD. Now, some astronomers believe that a star uh, that the wise men had followed into Bethlehem was a similar conjunction of the planets. In this case, Jupiter and Venus combined with a bright star called Regulus. And they know that that happened in the year 2 AD. But ultimate, as you, ultimately, though, as you read the literature, no one knows for sure exactly what it is that these wise men followed. That was my sermon starter for earlier in the week. That's how my celebration of the Feast of Epiphany was supposed to go, thinking about this star. Watching the wise men making this joyous journey, uh, following whatever it happened to be, to find Jesus underneath it. And then Wednesday happened. And things took on a much different tone on Wednesday, didn't they? Yeah. It's a tough time for us right now. As you worship today, whether it's online here, I'm guessing if you're watching this, you're watching online, but we'll ask the same question to the folks who will be in the building here uh, this coming Sunday morning. How do you feel today as you come into worship? Can you be honest about that? Can you tell God how you feel? Have you been telling God how you feel? Sometimes I wonder if we feel like God wants to hear us complain, right? But I ask you that question today, how do you feel? Well, I'll answer it. Maybe you can pause the video after I'm done. You can add your own in there. Me, tired. I am tired. I feel physically tired. I feel emotionally and spiritually wrung out by all of the things that we have gone through this week. I am tired. I think I'd just like to curl up and take a nice long nap. Actually, maybe we'll pause the video here and we'll have a quick nap. I'd like to. Tired. I'm confused. I don't really know what's going on. I don't know what the truth is. I've watched the news on both sides, and they're telling me different things. I feel like I'm a tennis ball at Wimbledon, back and forth. And if you ever watch Wimbledon, you'll watch that happen like a billion times. Don't you feel like that? I do. I feel confused. I don't know who to believe. Who's telling the truth? Because everybody's telling me they're telling me the truth. Confused. I'm angry. I am ticked off. I'm sorry, but watching everything that's going on, doesn't it just make your blood boil? It's why everybody's yelling at each other. We are angry. Angry in a way that maybe we've been for a long while, but right now that teapot is just exploding. We are angry. I'm angry. I'm scared. As I was watching the news last night on my phone, I had this knot in my stomach, and every once in a while I could feel a little sweat rise up. This was scary stuff. The America that I grew up in, it seemed last night that this thing existed no more. A lot of the, the security and the, the, the comfort that I felt as being in America last night, I feared for that. I was scared. A good night of sleep helped a little bit, but it is still a very scary time. I was talking with somebody on the phone a little while ago, and they said, well, it can't get any worse from here, and you think, it can? We said that about 2020. I'm scared. I feel a little bit hopeless. I don't, I don't know what to do here. Is there a light at the end of this tunnel? As a Christian, I say yes, but uh, as an American, and looking at the nation, is there hope here? It's kind of hard to find at this point. I'm going to hope that there's hope, but... Right now, I don't feel a lot of hope. I feel hopeless. I mentioned I'm angry. Sometimes when you feel hopeless, you get mad. You start lashing out at people around you. Have you 
been watching people lash out at each other? This is out of hopelessness and fear. I feel disappointed. Originally, I felt disappointed in our elected leaders. How could they act like this? Don't they know that they're supposed to be serving us as the people? And then I became disappointed with us. We elected them. We put them in office. We have allowed this partisanship to rule our elections. We have refused to budge. I'm disappointed with myself. And I'm disappointed with all of us that we've allowed things to get to this point. And that makes me angry. Did I mention that? I also find myself being embarrassed. This is embarrassing to watch, is it not? Like a bunch of petulant children watching ourselves on the news. It's embarrassing. I, and the rest of the nations are looking at us and saying, what is wrong with you people? And I feel a deep sense of embarrassment about that. That's a tough pill to swallow. How else do I feel today? Inadequate. I woke up this morning saying, I got to make a worship video. What am I going to tell people about all of this? I don't know. I feel inadequate. Fortunately, my inadequacies always drive me to Jesus. So maybe I'm glad for my inadequacy today. I don't have five things to tell you today that if you obey my five point plan, that America will be better and your life will be better and your kids will be honor students and you'll get a new car. I don't have any of that. I feel inadequate, but I trust that in the midst of that inadequacy, God's gonna do something, I believe he will. I feel weak, I just feel weak. And I know we all experience that right now. This, let's just be honest about the way our week is gone. You've got to tell God about these things so he can deal with us in, in the truth of the situation. You know, it's kind of funny. I found myself uh, over the last 24 hours here wishing that it was 2020 again. I didn't see that coming. But I started thinking back, you know, back in 2020, um, I could wash my hands. I could wear a mask. I could make sure I don't touch my face after being in public. I could just stay home. And if I did those things, I had over a 99% chance of being okay. You can't sanitize your hands and get rid of what we've been watching this week. I'd almost rather have the virus than to have to go through this. And isn't that saying something? Yeah, and part of me is thinking, well, get the virus, at least you'll be over it in two weeks and life will go on. I'm not sure that I have that same kind of hope or confidence at this point. And that's not minimizing the virus. I, it, this is a real thing and it has caused a lot of damage. I get that. And yet, I think what I'm saying here is the things that we watched yesterday, <laughs> it makes it almost look attractive if you had to choose between the two. That's all I'm trying to say by that. Well, anyway, there's a confession right there. And hopefully I've touched on some words maybe you felt. Maybe you came up with other ones. You can uh, email or you can maybe even comment below and put your own word in there. That's fine. I'd appreciate that. I am inadequate standing here. I don't know what to say to you other than this. It's Epiphany Week in the church. And I believe that as we come into contact today with God's word, is he's going to have something to say to us in the midst of this. Today, God's word needs to speak to us as Americans in the midst of the kind of week that we have been having. And I believe God's word does that, right? It's, it's why I have hope, because I know God, despite what we feel right now, is, I don't want to say God's not bothered by this, but he doesn't have these same feelings that we do. God is sovereign over this. He sing, sees all things as he is. God's going to still speak to us in the midst of this. And I really believe that, and that gives me some hope. And it's also going to speak to all of the nations of the world. This isn't, today isn't just all about America and what we've been through. There's Christians all over the world with their own struggles and their own fears, and God's word is going to speak to them as well. Because today's word is really a word for the nations, and we're going to see that here. Let's move to the story. For whatever reason it was, Matthew chapter 2 today, you can have your Bible open and read along if you want. For whatever reason, God wanted the other nations of the world, especially to those to the east of Israel, they wanted him to know Jesus. They wanted them to know what he was doing in this little boy who was in Bethlehem. God wanted everyone to know it. 
if you read through the, uh, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 60 was our other reading for today, but for brevity's sake, I didn't read it. But one of the promises there is that Israel exists uh, to radiate God's light to the world. Not that they were the light, but that God would be glorified through his people Israel and that that would be for the nations. At this point, God's not just concerned about one people, he's concerned for all people. Good for us Americans to keep in mind. We're not even the biblical Israel. Uh, and yet it is not just all about us today. But part of the good news is that this goodness and generosity that God showed to Israel, he wanted even these nations off to the east to know. And so for some reason, he put a star up into the sky so that these people would make a trip into Bethlehem. And so they do. God speaks to them in a, a way that they would understand, right? He speaks to them through the stars. I think ancient people knew the skies a lot better than we do now. And when God decided to call them, he did so through the stars. And they got the message, so much so were they excited that they made this journey then to Bethlehem. They compelled, felt compelled to make the journey to see he who has been born king of the Jews. They knew why they were going. God had done something amazing in this one who is called King of the Jews. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. And when they arrived at the place where Jesus was, they did two things. Number one, this is important for us today, they fell down and they worshipped Jesus. They, fell, they got down on their hands and knees. Grown men in front of a toddler, they got down on their hands and knees because they realized that this one that God had sent them to come see that he was important, important enough that they were to take a knee to him and recognize him for the greatness. They had no clue what Jesus was ever going to do at this point, but they knew he was great. They worshiped him, but the gifts that they gave him also indicated that they knew of his greatness. Gold, the gift that you would give to a king. Frankincense or incense, that is a gift that you offered to a god. And myrrh. That is a, an embalming gift, a gift that you give to somebody uh, in order to embalm a body. These are the three gifts the wise men gave. And we learn a lot from that during Epiphany. This is a time where we uh, have the light bulb come on and we understand who is this baby born in the manger? Well, today the wise men, these foreigners are the first one to say it. He's a God, he is a king, and he will die, he will suffer. In our language, he will become a sacrifice. And then these wise men went home knowing that God had broken into human history in an amazing way in this young toddler and that God's salvation was now breathing and alive in the world. Let us recognize that today. I want to look at the reactions of the people in this story. These wise men, when they got to the house and they opened the door and they went in and they saw Jesus there, it said, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Have you felt that way at all this week? Have you rejoiced exceedingly with great joy? Can you remember the last time you did that? Those are, in one sentence, three words of just super emphasis that they were overjoyed, rejoiced exceedingly with great joy when they saw Jesus. Take a deep breath at this point. Jesus, his name has been mentioned. The scriptures have spoken to us this morning, haven't they? I rejoice exceedingly with great joy in the midst of what we're going through right now because God has broken into the world. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. That should cause us joy even in the midst of darkness. Even as I record this right now, I just had a little moment of joy and happiness. Not because things changed, but because I was in the scriptures and God spoke to us. He spoke to me. Rejoice exceedingly with great joy, Scott. You were baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. You belong to him. Right? Celebrate just for a second in the midst of this. This is good news. This is the gospel, isn't it? They were happy. King Herod, however, felt differently. He set out to destroy Jesus. We know if you keep reading in Matthew chapter 2 that Joseph and Mary have to take Jesus and they have to flee to Egypt in order to get away from King Herod. And so Jesus' life was spared, but not forever. Jesus knows that he will have his day in front of the authorities. And you know the end of his story. I want to read a little bit today from John 
chapter 18. This is the final night of Jesus' life. On that night, Jesus had to go stand in front of the authorities. This time, it is the Roman governor of Judea, that area that Jerusalem was a part of, and his name, of course, Pontius Pilate. And when he stood in front of Pontius Pilate, he was asked, are you the king of the Jews? Now, if you read John chapter 18, Jesus doesn't say yes, but he doesn't say no either. But he does give us an answer. He goes, my kingdom is not of this world. So the answer is yes, he has a kingdom. If you got a kingdom, you're a king, right? Yes, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. It's not on Google Maps. You can't GPS it. There's no boundaries. There's no capital building. My kingdom is not of this world, but I do have a kingdom. A little moment here to celebrate again. Jesus has a kingdom that this world cannot touch. Praise God for that. If my kingdom were of this world, as he continues on, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Don't expect an army to come in here tonight and to try to save me and to try to displace you and put me on the throne. Jesus says, that is not the way it's gonna do. Instead, Jesus is going to earn that gift that the wise men gave him. He's gonna need that frankincense, or I'm sorry, he's gonna need that myrrh. He's gonna need that embalming spice. At the beginning, you're like, that's a very inappropriate gift to give a young child, but Jesus is now saying, bring out the myrrh. My coronation will not be with an army Putting me on your throne, Pilate, my coronation will be my death, death on a cross. I will become a curse. I will die under the curse of sin, which is death. That will be my coronation on the cross. Put the crown of thorns on my head. That is the time that I will be crowned king of this kingdom that is not of this world. I am going to sacrifice my perfect and innocent life and blood for the forgiveness of sins of this world. And that's got to include the stuff we're going through right now, friends. That has to be included under that blood of Jesus. Question is, how does today's gospel lesson help me to know how to react to what's been going on in America in these last few days? One of the kingdoms of this world? Well, Today is not only the day we're celebrating the Epiphany, but if we follow the church year calendar, today's actual assigned readings are for the baptism of Jesus. This is the day where he shows up at the Jordan River. We talked about that at the beginning of Advent when we see John the Baptist begin his ministry. Today is baptism of Jesus Sunday as well. And the very first words out of Jesus' lips after he begins his public ministry, once he is baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, after he's been 40 days in the wilderness and he has survived all of the temptations and all of the cheap and easy fixes that the devil offers him, the first words out of Jesus' mouth, and since this year we're in the Gospel of Mark, this is Mark chapter 1, verse 13. Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Repent. John the Baptist told us during that Advent, how do you get ready for the kingdom? You repent. You make a U-turn. You realize you're going in the wrong way. As a nation, you realize that you are going in a wrong way and that if you keep going that way, it's going to end badly. You make a U-turn. You repent. What does that look like for us? Here's my list today. Number one, be quiet. Be quiet. Enough of this trying to shout louder than the other person. Enough of that. It's time to be quiet. Repentance is realizing that the shouting louder and louder does not work. It's time to make a U-turn. What's the U-turn from shouting louder and trying to get your own way? It's to zip it. Be quiet. What else is involved in repentance? Number two, get on your knees. This is a call to prayer in general, but this is also a position of 
of subservience. This is what the wise men did when they saw Jesus. They got on their knees. They bowed their knees, a sign of submission. That is the job of Christians right now is to get on our knees. We repent. We confess our sins of complicity with our world, with our nation, with our communities, with ourselves, with our families. We are the ones who have created this storm. We as Christians, we take that seriously. What did we just do earlier in our confession? God, we come before you today asking for your gracious mercy for all of the things that we have done and that we have left undone. We have lived in darkness rather than seeking your light. We have ignored your call to serve our neighbors and we have neglected to show our gratitude for all that you've done for us. If you don't know what to do right now, there's a good thing. Last night I told my wife, I said, I don't know what to do right now. But as I wrote the sermon, I said, you know what? I do know exactly what to do right now. Shut up, get on my knees, and confess my sins. This is my fault. I'm a part of it. The sin isn't looking across the aisle at those people and telling them to repent. That's not where it starts as Christians. It starts with us. We can do it on behalf of a nation as well. Repentance express our need for God's kingdom to break in upon us. We're going to pray that in a little bit, aren't we? Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because we can't make that happen on our own. We repent, we be silent, we confess our sins, and we express our need and we ask God, please bring that perfect kingdom of God, which we know is coming, bring it to us. I believe that this is what we as Christians ought to be doing right now more than anything else that we can think of to do, right? And haven't you asked that question, what can I do right now? We can do that. We should be doing that. We should be repenting of anything else, including the bearing of arms or the bearing of thumbs. These things don't work. They don't work. And if we think that it is weakness to do those things, to repent instead of to bearing arms or to bearing thumbs, then we don't know Jesus and we don't understand that he is God's plan of salvation for this world. We need to take that seriously. On Wednesday evening, a good friend of Melissa and I's, uh, Roxy from Michigan, she posted on her Facebook feed that very meaningful picture that has meant so much. Uh, to me personally this year, that, that picture of Jesus in the storm, and actually our friend Gary uh, earlier this week had emailed me and he said, remember that picture, Pastor? And I have, I appreciate that. Here's the picture, Jesus in the storm. You might actually either come back to it even now if you wanna pause and meditate on that picture a little bit. You can go ahead and do that if you want. And then unpause it and I'll still be here yapping. Some would say that this picture right here that we're looking at is a picture for escapists, right? The father of communism, Karl Marx, what did he call religion? He says, religion is the opium of the masses. This is what the people do to deaden their pain, much like alcohol, painkillers, gambling, shopping, work, uh, pornography, what? Ever these things that we turn to to deaden the pain in the world around us and the pain inside of us. Mark said, religion is like that. It is the opium of the people. It is just a painkiller so that you don't have to deal with what's going on around you. That is one man's opinion. Many share it, unfortunately. But you know what scares me? Is that some would like to take this picture and they would like to airbrush Jesus out of the picture. We think that we can calm this storm without him. We think that we can make those waves go away. Storming the Capitol, yelling at each other, all of these things, we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get the waves to stop and we're doing it under our own power and it is not gonna work. Four more years of President Trump isn't gonna fix that storm and I guarantee you this, four years of Joe Biden will do no better. Battling it out on social media has only made it worse. And 
burying your heads in the sand. That's kind of what I'd like to do. Burying my head in the sand and hoping it is just going to go away. Well, that's not going to work either. This is an opportunity. How come God didn't just prevent all of this from happening? He's driving us to our knees. He is reminding us of our great need. He is calling us to repentance and to, and to renewal. And if we as Christians don't model that, if we as Christians don't even believe that, then we have nothing to offer the world. But I also think this is the greatest thing at this point that we have to offer the world. Repenting before the Lord our God, looking at Jesus as being the only one who is the master of the storm. The wind and the waves. Our only hope is that Jesus is at the center of that picture. We didn't elect him to be there. We don't choose for him to be there. He is there just because God put him there. This is Emmanuel, God with us, and he is standing in the midst of that storm. The problem is when you take your eyes off Jesus and you start looking at those waves, and maybe Peter was doing that, looking around, saying, how can I fix my situation? And he sank until Jesus reached out and picked him up and said, Peter, don't take your eyes off me, you of little faith. This picture, powerful, powerful picture for us today. Our only hope is that Jesus is indeed already at the center of that storm. And today, we're reminded, he is God. He is king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day, that fullness of the kingdom of God will come to us. But he's also a sacrifice. The love of God has sacrificed Jesus for you, for me, for our neighbors, for those other people on social media who don't agree with us, for those other people on the other sides of the Jesus has been sacrificed for them as well. He's God, he is king, and he is sacrificed. I want to end our sermon today. Jesus is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. One day he will come back and he will make all things new. His perfect kingdom will be here. The government, as we sing, will rest upon his shoulders. No more death, tears, crying, pain, election scandal, coups, whatever it is you want to go. These things will all be gone. And so the very last two verses of the Bible, I want to leave us with this today. Amen. Not a woman. Couldn't help it. Sorry. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. It's the hope of the church. Come, Lord Jesus. It's the hope of the world. Come, Lord Jesus. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all. That is our prayer today. Amen.
As Christians, we confess our faith each and every week using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, uh, we join our hearts together. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. We pray for all people according to their needs. Let us pray. God of light, you sent your son Jesus into the world to bring light into this world. Illumine the darkness that pervades the lives of so many of your precious people, that they might have renewed hope in your love. Grant that the shadows of the past, of the present, and into the future would be put to rest by brighter days, living in the freedom and the forgiveness of sin, and that that would inspire us to greater devotion to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, grant us the honor of being able to sit at the feet of those who are full of your wisdom. Help us to learn your will and your ways as we observe and listen to those who have spent their lives dwelling in your holy presence. Help us to take that wisdom and to use it in situations in which you place us so that others would know the name that is above every other name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you're the source of all peace, and your Son is the Prince of Peace. Bring an everlasting peace to this world, to this nation, and to our communities that you love, so that all might live in security and in joy. Help us to be peacemakers, bearing your light and your love to all who are suffering in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious Lord, pour out your healing balm of comfort on all who mourn and all who suffer this day. Grant to all of us who are troubled the joy of your saving help. Remind us, your children, that you see and that you know our every need even before we speak it aloud to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These things, Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and we pray like he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, as you begin this brand new week, go with the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May the light of God's word ever shine within your hearts and your lives so that his name is praised throughout our world. Amen. Go in peace. Let your light shine. Thanks be to God.